morning. I can't tell you what a joy it is to be back at Smith Street Church this morning, to see wonderful friends, old friends, meet some new friends. So thank you for that. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations and thoughts of all of our hearts and minds be pleasing to you. Amen. I want to thank you also for the opportunity to be here on behalf of the people of Faith United Church, of which many have come, many have come this morning. We are on something of a pilgrimage this summer having left the little theater at the South Secondary School on Highway 15, where we normally meet every Sunday morning at 9.30. Thank you for the extra hour. And we've been visiting with other neighboring churches this, uh, this summer a little bit. Last Sunday, we were with the Presbyterians at St. John's United and Sand Hill Presbyterian. And so, did I say St. John's United? St. John's Presbyterian in Sand Hill, uh, two point pastoral charge. So that was delightful. This Sunday we're here with you. Next Sunday we're at Zion. It's great. We're really enjoying getting out again and, and uh, meeting people, seeing how others do worship, and uh, sharing a little bit of our own experience as well. So thank you. But Faith United Church has been on another kind of pilgrimage over these last three years that I'm going to share with you in more depth in a moment. Um, but as, as we all know, one of the things that we share with our Presbyterian neighbors, our Anglican neighbors, or our Catholic neighbors, is that our churches were all participants in the residential school system operated by the government of Canada and run by many of the churches, those four. We all know that this has been judged in the light of history as one of our darkest chapters in our country. The Presbyterian Church ran 11 schools up until 1925 when um, it handed over nine of those 11 to the United Church of Canada when it was formed that year. The United Church also assumed the ones that were run by the Methodist Church. And at their height, in the 1930s, there were 130 residential schools across Canada. Roman Catholics ran over 60% of them, Anglicans ran 25%, and Presbyterians in the United Church ran the remaining 15%. Now the last school, some of you may be surprised to know, closed in 1996. So what took place in those schools isn't just something from our collective past, but it took place within the lifetime of, I'd say, pretty much everybody here in the room this morning. Dealing with that legacy has been and continues to be a major priority for the United Church of Canada, which was the first denomination in Canada <coughs> to issue an apology to Indigenous peoples in 1986, and Lynn made reference to that apology in her comments already. The other participating denominations, with the exception of the Roman Catholic Church, have followed suit in, in making formal apologies. But in some ways, you know, it was only with the establishment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the release of the Commission's findings that the horror of what took place in those residential schools really began to settle in to our consciousness. Now I think we are fortunate. I think we're fortunate that in this country, we decided to do what South Africa and other countries with the history of repression that created division have done, and that is to create a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So the TRC, as it's known, was set out with a mandate to bring to light and to document the history and the impacts of the residential school system on the people who lived through it and survived them. And to tell the story of the many who didn't. The TRC spent six years, six full years, traveling to every part of Canada 
to hear the testimony of about 6,000 indigenous people who, as children, were taken away from their families and placed in residential schools. So when the TRC's report and their 94 calls for action were finally released in 2015 by Justice Murray Sinclair, and I remember so well when he came to the Isabel for a, for a session and presented those findings there. When that happened, friends, no Canadian could ignore this dark legacy in our past. Now it's easy to feel shame, it's easy to feel remorse for the past, but you know what? We in the United Church have walked a very long way since the 1986 apology, but there's a lot to be done. So let's just get rid of that mantle of shame and remorse and keep moving forward with actions. Passages such as the one that we read this morning from the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Corinthians seem to offer us both some hope and a task. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to God's self through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, we've got a job to do. We've got a task to be active participants in making right that which has been wronged, of being part of the healing of broken relationships and of setting them right again. So what then is our peace in this work? Of the 94 calls to action, and that's a lot to take in, four of them were specifically directed at the churches. Call 48 calls on the churches to formally adopt and comply with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a framework for reconciliation. As a denomination, we've approved that. Call 59 calls upon the churches to develop ongoing educational strategies to ensure that our congregations learn about their church's role in colonization and in residential schools and why apologies are necessary. Well, those educational strategies and those materials are, are available. We have them. Call number 60 calls upon church leaders in collaboration with indigenous spiritual leaders and school survivors to develop and teach curriculum for students, for clergy, and those who work in Aboriginal communities on the need to respect indigenous spirituality in its own right. The United Church has been doing this for some time. Call 61 calls upon church parties to the Indian Residential Schools Agreement to establish permanent funding to Aboriginal people for projects that will further community-controlled healing and reconciliation, culture and language revitalization. The Healing Fund was established in 1994, and today it remains part of the response of the United Church, an important part, to support Indigenous communities. So it's clear then that of those four calls to action, the National United Church has been at work on all four of them for many, many years. But what about us? What about our congregations? What have we been doing? What can we do to live out our calling to this ministry of reconciliation. So I want to suggest briefly four things, four things. The first is we, can, we, we need to start by learning about the realities that Indigenous peoples have experienced and are experiencing today. And you know, this is kind of a thing you do from a distance at, at the beginning, but you can, you can do things like start a, a church lending library. We can do that. We can seek out great films and television programs. I think of Richard Wagamese's amazing film, Iron Horse, that was showing at the screening room a few months ago and, and is still available through TIFF. Or the CBC's Eighth Fire, which I think you're offering for members of the congregations to come and, and to watch. 
These are incredible resources. You can tune into radio and podcasts, radio shows, some great ones like CBC's Unreserved. You can read the TRC's report. You can read the little booklet of the 94 Calls to Action. You can read the newspapers with an eye out for news about or news impacting Indigenous peoples. And so you can learn. And as you travel on holidays, you can seek out places that are important to Indigenous peoples or our history with them. So I want to give you an example because this past week we went up to visit family. Family in North Bay and then family in Sault Ste. Marie and um, to be honest with you, I don't really talk to my family too much about this because they have a different point of view, especially in the Sioux. But my nephew, his wife, Karen, she works at Algoma University in the Sioux. And that was formerly known as Shingwak Hall. It was a residential school run by the Anglican Church of Canada. And Karen told us that on Friday, and this was Wednesday night, she said on Friday, there would be ceremony held with a lot of people coming, the Lieutenant Governor of the province, and many, many people were coming. I think Roberta Jameson was there. And they were there to inaugurate a new exhibit entitled Reclaiming Shingwak Hall. It is the first major permanent residential school survivor driven exhibition in a formal former residential school. Now we had to leave on Thursday morning, so we weren't gonna be there Friday for all the fun. But Karen gave us a sneak preview on Thursday morning of this stunning new exhibit in this old residential school. And we learned so much. Now that's a surprise, that kind of opportunity. It was just a surprise to us, but we learned so much and it was so wonderful to be able to hear the incredible things that Algoma University is doing, like they are miles ahead. And so uh, all that right there in Sault Ste. Marie, and we would have missed it if we hadn't had our ears open. So keep your ears open when you travel. The second thing that I think we as church members need to do is consider our own identity. Consider our history. What are the impressions and beliefs that may have shaped our perceptions of Indigenous peoples? Where did our ancestors come from? What impact did their arrival have? On who? What were we taught in school about Indigenous peoples here? What impressions were formed in our young minds when we were kids by movies and games and television? I can remember playing cowboys and Indians with those little plastic figures up at the cottage and the Indians were always presumed to be the bad guys. Now, if you've seen that terrific film that I mentioned, Richard Wagami's Indian Horse, about that gifted young indigenous hockey player, those are the same little figures that you see in the movie being thrown on the ice. So if you've seen the movie or read the book, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen the movie, Indian Horse, it's not an easy film, but after you've seen it, you will have a far deeper and more profound understanding of the trauma and the harm that was left in the wake of the residential school system and how that trauma lives on today. But you'll also see the resilience of the people and you'll see glimmers of hope. The third thing we need to do you know, they always say a good sermon's three points. Well, I got four, so sorry. Third point, we need to get out there and we need to actually meet Indigenous neighbors of ours. And when we meet them, we need to listen to what they have to say. You know, here in Kingston, what are we, 124, 25,000 people? There are 5,000 identified on the census, self-identified, of Indigenous ancestry here. And the informal estimates put that number much, much higher, maybe as high as 10,000 people with Indigenous ancestry. So here's some questions. Have we ever been, have we ever been 
to a ceremony hosted by the Grandmother's Council. We're all invited. How about a powwow? Ever been to a powwow? Next weekend, Tayendanega is going to have their annual powwow. Why not go? Let's go. We went last year. It was a ton of fun, honestly. Every year at the Kingston Writers' Festival in September, there's always terrific and acclaimed Indigenous authors. I know four heavyweights at least who are coming, I think four or five this year. So there's lots of opportunities to meet and get to know people if we start looking for them. And when we do, we will likely find ourselves welcomed and included into the circle because that is the Indigenous way. Fourth thing, prayerfully consider what else we might do as congregations, how we might join with others. I know Sydney Street and Chalmers have been meeting together to learn and study for some time on questions of reconciliation. What more might you do to go deeper? If you're short on ideas, Google Canada Helps 150 Acts. Or if you can remember it, Canada Helps 150 Acts of Reconciliation, six words. If you put that in, up will pop 150 suggestions of what any of us can do. Now I mentioned at the beginning that faith has been on a bit of a pilgrimage as a congregation. You know, when that TRC report came out, we were deeply challenged and the calls to action as well. And so we began to prayerfully talk about what we might do. What part of this, the work of reconciliation could we really contribute to? Now a piece of land on Highway 15 had been purchased for Faith United almost 30 years ago to build a church on. Um, and a decision was made somewhere along the, the line to not build another church building in Kingston and so that land has sat with a sign on it saying Future Home of Faith United. And about, I don't know, seven years ago, we changed it to, to Faith United meets at LaSalle at 9.30 every Sunday morning. Join us if you, if you wish, something like that. So that land has just been a field tilled by the local farmer for all these years. So we asked ourselves, couldn't something be done with that property? Could it be used for a reconciliation initiative together with the indigenous people here in this area? How could we get to know these people? Because few of us knew them. What did we know about our own past? What did we know about the history, even on this place? What did we know about the present situation? Where could we turn to learn more? How might our faith and the scriptures instruct and guide us in some next steps. So we were asking all these questions. And these are complex issues, complex questions. 94 calls to action. But despite all of that complexity, we were brought back to the simple call to just walk one step at a time. Words like the passage that was read this morning by Sue from the prophet Micah. God has told you, O oh mortal, what is good? And what does God require of you? But to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. So in the past three years, we've been busy. We began with, number one, educating ourselves and learning. We got a lending library of books and audiovisual and other things going at the church. And we invited many Indigenous local people to come and share with us. And then we started accepting their invitations too, to join their events, to attend the quarterly ceremonies of the Grandmother's Council, to show up at the local powwows to celebrate National Indigenous Day in June, and many other things. And maybe the most important thing of all of that was we just spent time together listening, learning, getting to know, getting to know each other. Now, among the things that we've learned, we've learned that there is no one indigenous community in Kingston. It's a very diverse population of people from many tribals, 
tribal backgrounds and clan backgrounds who, who have come here and called Kingston home. We learned that after the closure of the Friendship Center, they've had no common meeting place to, to go. There is no piece of land upon which they can go out, hold their ceremonies, grow their sacred medicines, practice their traditions. And we learned also that the identified indigenous leaders are stretched thin. They're often asked to represent their people or help non-indigenous people like ourselves learn about their realities. So on that front, we need to do our own work and understand and learn. So as we began to talk together about how the land could be used for a joint reconciliation initiative, ideas started to flow. And it depends who you asked. Even today, if I asked people from faith, what do you think we should use the land for? If I asked 10 people, I'll get nine and a half different variations on our ideas. So, but in, basically, we envision an open garden space where the medicines can be grown, where ceremony can be had, some of it together, where education can take place and people can gather. That's, that's the general vision. Last December, we engaged a national indigenous consulting firm, Three Things Consulting, that happened to be based in Kingston. We engaged them to survey indigenous people in Kingston on this idea, this unformed vision. And the people themselves named the project walking the path of peace together. The resulting report, 38 page report, was based on surveys with about 100 people. It confirmed a desire to walk with us in developing the land together. It's a fascinating report. There's tons that's in there and I would commend it to you. You can find it on our website. But one of the interesting things was at Faith, we had kind of done a little bit of a test. How are we feeling? How are we feeling about this initiative? And we got everything from really excited to scared to death and every feeling in between. In the survey, they asked the same question of the indigenous respondents. They got an exact mirror image of our feelings. So they're feeling the same way, really excited, scared to death, not sure we can trust these church people. Let's do it anyway, let's try all of those kinds of responses. And the same vision for how we might use this land was affirmed in the report. So we've decided we're gonna to begin to walk together this week, we're gonna have a meeting and form the land council, and we're gonna see how it unfolds. We're gonna see what the creator, the great spirit, the Holy Spirit, has in store. Now on July 1st, this past July 1st, or Canada Day, we had our second annual gathering out on the land. Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, we came to pray, we came to hold ceremony, we came to commit to a better walk together into the future. And despite, if you remember Canada Day, it was about 36, 37 degrees, and despite the heat, 40 people came out, half Indigenous, half non-Indigenous. We had a wonderful time together. And you know, even if all we ever do is get to know one another and pray together once a year for a brighter future, it'll have all been worth it. But we don't believe that's going to be the end of this vision. It's not going to be the end of our walking the path of peace together. If you're interested in reading that report, as I said, it's on our website. And if you're interested in helping out, we'd be glad to welcome your involvement once we form that council and develop a strategy. We'd be glad to involve other churches. And as always, we would covet your prayers for this initiative as it continues to unfold. So I wanna close this morning by just telling you something that happened a week ago Friday, Friday night, at the General Council of the United Church, meets every three years. And this time it met at Durham College in the north end of Oshawa. 
Now, for decades now, indigenous members of the church have uh, lit a sacred fire when the general council meet, and they've kept it going through the duration of the week. And at the close of each general council, they have gathered up the ashes from the fire, and they have entrusted them to the elders who keep them and then bring them back to lay as a base for the next general council's sacred fire. This year, however, college policy prohibited an open fire on campus. So they had to find another place for the sacred fire. Well, they wound up finding one, but it was a good 10 kilometers down on the shores of Lake Ontario. Because it was so far away, because it wasn't possible to walk there, it really was impossible to properly keep that fire. So late on that Friday night, a week and a, a bit ago, an Indigenous elder was moved in the closing session of the General Council to come forward, bringing the half-burned chunks of charcoal, and she placed them on the communion table. She said, I bring what's left of the fire, but this isn't our bundle. This is your bundle to carry. And with those words, she went and sat down. With those words, I think she's both inviting and challenging the non-Indigenous leadership of the United Church and all of us to continue the work of reconciliation. So in the same way as the words of the Apostle Paul have reminded us, we've been invited and challenged to carry forward Christ's ministry of reconciliation. This is now our bundle to carry. How we will walk the path of peace and reconciliation together is the question. It's a question for us all to prayerfully consider. So I want to thank you again for welcoming us this morning, and thanks be to God for this ministry of reconciliation entrusted to us all. Amen. I've been asked to do the invitation to the offering, and so what we usually say at faith is something like, friends, we have been so richly blessed with so much, and when we give back a little bit of that, we enable the ministry of this church and the wider United Church of Canada in this place, in this country, and around the world to continue to happen. And so our offering will now be received. <laughs> 